Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. As we head toward winter, we want to talk about some of the potential fire danger in Oklahoma right now, as well as what the conditions are really like. For perspective, we caught up with our extension fire ecologist, John Weir. We received the least amount of rainfall December, January, and February. Also, if you look at it, most of the fronts and stuff that we get, our weather patterns have changed, and so now our fronts and stuff are coming from the north, northwest, and most of these are dried out before they ever get here. So very little in the form of any kind of moisture or precip. So again, that's what it is. And then you have the lack of growing vegetation out here. Everything's dormant, it's dry, so humidities are lower, the the fine fuels or the grasses all the herbaceous material out here is dry and so it's it's the perfect situation for burning and then when you start putting in weather conditions what like we'll we'll have this time of year of fronts that come through with extremely low humidities high winds and several day period of high winds followed by a switching wind coming out of the opposite direction at a high high velocity or hard rate of speed. That sets up a perfect situation for wildfires. It also, if you're thinking about doing prescribed burns and stuff, it makes it a lot more difficult to try to get those accomplished because we're trying to hit those perfect weather conditions. So it's, it's the winter months are definitely a, a, a difficult time for fire in both respects of wildfire and for prescribed fire. For those people who are interested in that prescribed fire, you know, you kind of ha maybe have a little extra time on your hands, want to clean yeah. up your place. What do you recommend? I recommend, you know, this is the time of year, especially with most people, you know, a lot of people burn in that in those spring month, late winter, spring, February, March, April, coming up in here. Now is a really good time to start planning those burns, start getting those fire plans out, making sure we, we get them we get them written up. We start preparing fire breaks, determining what's our burn unit gonna be. Well, let's get on that downwind side and let's take our chainsaw and let's go out, we got extra time. Let's cut some cedar trees down, drag them well away from that edge. That way they're not a problem when we burn. So this is the time of year to get to prep and get stuff ready for those burns. Now I know it's been a while since we've had a lot of snow, but say we do get some. Is that enough moisture then to get those conditions more favorable to actually burn this winter? Uh, you know, again, snow can give us a little bit of moisture and stuff. A lot of times what I think a lot of people see when they when they, we get a little bit of snow, that's what people get really excited about burning brush piles. So it may be there when you light the pile off, but by the time that, that pile's still going to smolder for several days, some piles even smolder for weeks, that wind may come up, nobody's there, you'd burn that brush pile when the snow was there, everything was fine, but now the day later, there it goes, high winds hit, blows embers, and we're off to the races chasing that thing down and that's that's not a good deal. So this time of year is definitely not the time to be burning brush piles. That's something to be left for late spring, early summer, that April, May, and June. The OK Fire program, there's lots of tools that people can access, resources. Now may be a good time to study up on that's, some things. That's exactly right. So again, looking, you know, again, when we do do prescribed burns, planning prescribed burns, you know, weather is what we're looking for. That's one of the main things about a prescribed burn. It's prescribed under certain conditions. And so those conditions, we're trying to figure out when are the best days, what's that forecast, and what tools we have. OK Fire's out there. It's got some great, uh, you know, near real-time weather data that we can use to look at, you know, actual temperatures, wind speeds, relative humidity. So Fire Prescription Planner is in there to help you plan your burnout to see if this would be a good day to do that. So there's a lot of tools. So again, it would be a great time if you're not real familiar with it, get on it you know, search around on it, play around with it, and figure out how to operate it a lot better. And then that way, whenever you do have burns this spring, that you're ready to roll. Sounds good. John, yeah. thanks a lot. Good to see you. And for a link to the OK Fire program, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. We're still a month or two away from the beginning of the spring calving season, but it's not too soon to begin to think about the colostrum needs that we may need for the first baby calf that is born to a difficult birth, and we have to supply the colostrum that that calf is going to need. 
You remember, colostrum contains the immunoglobulins or the antibodies that give those baby calves some disease protection. In a few cases, maybe uh, you have a two-year-old that's not giving enough milk, or you have a situation where the calf is born to a very difficult, long, arduous birthing process, and that calf is sluggish and won't get up in time to nurse the cow. And we all know that getting that colostrum into that baby calf within the first six hours is very, very important to his disease protection. And that's why having some colostrum already stored that we can thaw out and give to that baby calf in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, is pretty important for, for his future health. A couple of ways of getting that colostrum, natural colostrum, most people still consider the best, come from a cow perhaps that lost a calf that you'd milk out, or if there's still a dairy in your area, you might visit with those folks and see if you can purchase some of the colostrum that they can't put into the milk line and have that available to a store and have ready for next spring's calving. If you do that, I would suggest that you put one quart of the colostrum into a gallon-sized Ziploc bag and then lay that flat into the freezer to uh, be frozen until you're going to, to use it. If you do that, then it becomes easier to thaw out uh, when you need it quickly uh, next February or March. It's probably going to take at least two of those doses for each feeding of uh, most of these calves. We consider five to six percent of their body weight the adequate amount of colostrum for each feeding. And for an 80 pound uh, newborn calf, that equates to about two quarts of the colostrum going to be needed for that first feeding and then repeat that again about 12 hours later. If you can't get natural colostrum and have the opportunity to obtain some and freeze it and utilize it in that way, then I suggest that you uh, visit with your local veterinarian or the local feed store and purchase some commercial colostrum replacer. And I say that word replacer with some emphasis because that will contain at least 100 grams of immunoglobulin per dose. And that's a key number to keep in mind. Look on the label before you purchase it to make sure it has that much in terms of immunoglobulin available for each dose. I realize these things are expensive for each dose that you feed them, but let's remember that if we can keep that uh, calf alive until it's time to sell him the following fall at weaning time and he's worth several hundred dollars, then that one dose or two doses of that expensive colostrum replacer seems to be worth it. We hope this helps you a little bit in terms of getting ready for the upcoming calving season, having colostrum available when you need it at the time that you need it is going to be important as well. Hey, we we'll look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. It's been almost a year since the new veterinary feed directive went into effect. Sunup traveled to Pontotoc County to talk with Extension Veterinarian Dr. Barry Whitworth to see how producers are adjusting. The veterinary feed directive is the FDA went to the industries, the pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies that produce these drugs that we include in feed. Uh, and they asked them to voluntarily change the status of these drugs. And, and these companies agreed to do that. And, and the purpose of this is they want to better track the use of these antibiotics in animals because everybody's considered con, concerned about antimicrobial resistance. So that's what has started the veterinary feed directive. Uh, we have switched a lot of drugs that used to be available over the counter to now you have to get a veterinary feed directive in order to use those products in feeds. And to get a veterinary feed directive, it's all based upon uh, what we call a veterinary client patient relationship. We have to have a relationship with our veterinarians so that they know what your operation is about, what you're doing, and why you need to use whatever product you're requesting. So that was the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome initially. Uh, there have been some other things that have have kind of been row bumps, uh, I would say. Things like free choice minerals versus as fed minerals has been a big problem uh, for years before the veterinary feed directive. 
Uh, it wasn't legal, but we fed a lot of as-fed minerals in a free choice manner. We just put them out there, let the cows consume how much they wanted. Once we got to the veterinary feed directive, we were not able to do that anymore. We kind of had to stick to what the label tells us, and there's only a select few products that can be fed free choice. And if you're wanting to feed a free choice mineral, when we say free choice, we just put it out there and let the cows consume it then you have to use one of those products. And that was a little bit of a hurdle for some people because we'd used a lot of other products before and we can no longer use those products in that way anymore. Some people have just chosen not to do it. Uh, some people have gone to trying to use other means to control diseases such as vaccinations. And some people have just been reluctant to uh, switch over to the new requirements. And so they've chosen not to use any products at this time. It hasn't been a problem at all. I'm still buying and using the same product and the same things that I did. I, I haven't changed anything. I can't see why it would be anything drastic to people. If it did, it would be a help, you know, to them, I would think. Like I said, I've always used the medicated minerals, and I've seen through the years of production, I've seen what I believe has been a change in my animals and my calving on doing it. And, uh, you know, if it's not broke, don't worry about it. Some of the things that we've found with this veterinary feed directive that are offshoots of it is the fact that people are talking to their veterinary more. Uh, we're seeing uh, better herd health management. We're seeing people look more at vaccinations now. We're talking about biosecurity with people uh, and controlling diseases. So these are things that have, that have come out of this process that we didn't expect. I thought, you know, why? And then as I begin to rethink it, like I have other things in life, so they're just trying to help. So <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I need all the help I can get usually. <laughs>
Um, you know, the, the macro economy right now looks pretty good, but I think you, you have to be concerned that it could uh, have some problems going forward. So, uh, so it looks good. I think we carry some momentum into 2017, but we certainly will have some challenges. And I think for producers, that translates into some downside risk that you want to try to be uh, managing for uh, as we go forward. So. So really, be be conscious of it and, and and kind of plan for those downsides. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and we do expect overall that we'll see slightly weaker prices. Maybe not a lot weaker prices for for feeder cattle or cattle in general. Uh, but but more than likely, we will see a little bit of weakening in prices. And I think the threat is there that we could see more weakening than that if anything happens, particularly to beef demand uh, domestically or internationally. Okay, thank you much, Daryl Peel, livestock marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Good morning everyone, welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. As the old saying goes, we have 99 problems and rain ain't one of them. So let's go right to the data and look at the building drought that's forming across Oklahoma. Well, as we do every week, the newest drought monitor report shows more drought across Oklahoma. We now have a large area of severe drought, that's that darker brown um, down across the southeastern quarter of the state. Um, moderate drought has also encroached up into central Oklahoma and northeastern Oklahoma with a little dollop over there in the southwest Oklahoma. Then we have the other side of the state um, with the moderate to severe drought in northwest Oklahoma um, from the Woodward uh, Woods, Harper County area out into the Panhandle. Um, and then as you can see um, after that we have that yellow abnormally dry condition um, abnormally dry conditions signal a precursor to drought, and that covers most of the state. The only part of the state not um, in imminent danger of drought development right now is that area up around Osage County, Payne County, and those areas where they did get a little bit of rainfall um, previously in the year, a little bit of excessive rainfall, but we can look at that in a minute. Now we did get some rainfall down in southeast Oklahoma that, that helped stop the drought from uh, intensifying too rapidly down there, but again it was too little um, from about a quarter of an inch to uh, about an inch in some places. Again, just not enough to make a difference, but it was certainly welcome. So when we look at the consecutive days with less than a quarter inch of rainfall uh, from the mesonet, this map shows the problem. Nearly 70 days in the western panhandle to uh, 60 days in western Oklahoma to more than 45 days across central Oklahoma over into eastern parts of the state. So a long time without significant rainfall in the state, uh, therefore building drought. Now we can take a look at the damage done. The departure from normal rainfall map for the water year, that's October 1st forward. Um, we see deficits across the state from more than uh, six to seven inches down across far southeast Oklahoma three to five inches up into central Oklahoma, um, one to three to four inches up in northwest Oklahoma. And remember, it doesn't rain as much up there this time of the year, any time of the year really, um, so those amounts are still significant. But then we see that area up around Osage County, Payne County in that area um, that did get the excessive rainfall uh, earlier in October. So uh, that rainfall will last a while, but not forever. Now let's go to some more bad news, at least according to the precipitation outlook for December from the Climate Prediction Center. Um, we see a bullseye of increased odds of below normal precipitation right smack dab across Oklahoma, especially the western two-thirds of the state. Um, that is not good news and that's not a way to get rid of drought. Now the Climate Prediction Center's monthly drought outlook, given that precipitation outlook, is not very uh, optimistic. It has the drought where it is now, uh, continuing to persist or intensify, and then we see that dollop of uh, yellow out across the western half of the state. That's where drought is expected to develop uh, by the end of December. Now it has cooled down. That will help uh, reduce some of that moisture loss, but we just simply need some rain or snow, and again, we'll take anything we can get at this point. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Twenty seventeen's been an interesting year in the wheat markets, Kim. Let's just jump into it. What have we seen? 
Well, of course, we're seeing low prices, and on top of those low prices, you know, you go back to the 16 crop, uh, 130 million, pl million plus bushels this year, about 99 million, so down about 33% uh, from last year. So we had lower production and, and significantly lower prices. So right now there's, well, let's get real. There's just not any money. Actually, if you've got wheat, you're losing money. Mm -hmm. Now, it's been said that you're not a lover of wheat prices right now. Can you, can you jump into that? Well, the way I heard that was, Kim, you don't like wheat. Well. <laughs> I do like wheat, <laughs> right. you know, uh, but just not, I don't like the prices that we got and I don't like the quality of product we got. Uh, I don't like low quality wheat. I don't like wheat that we can't put on the market. I don't like wheat when, when we can't uh, compete on the world market because we have to compete. We can. Uh, and producers right now, some producers are making a, a profit, at least covering variable costs with wheat. I don't like current conditions. What's it going to take, and, 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 and I think I already know the answer to this, but what's it going to take to, to get that protein up to where you like it, to where it's marketable worldwide? Well, if you're talking about protein, I think one, uh, naturally it's got to be weather and weather conditions, but two, it's management, it's uh, putting down nitrogen applications, uh, maintaining soil for fertility, it's timing along with timely rains. I think uh, you look back at 12, 13, and 14, we had above 12% average protein. The weather cooperated then. Uh, we had uh, relatively good prices. Producers were putting down the uh, fertilizers. They were using the fungicides. They were doing management practices to produce a quality product, and they had a, had a price. Once prices went down below cost of production and they took out those inputs, mm -hmm. it got them on both sides. It got them on yield, it got them on quality, and it's got them on price. Are we seeing this worldwide? Is, is it just the U.S. that's having a hard time with, with wheat prices? No, a uh, farmer is a farmer, uh, you know, uh, around the world, and they react. All farmers react. But now if you go to the Soviet Union, you go to the Ukraine, uh, Argentina to a certain degree, where uh, you're producing a, a hard bread wheat, mm -hmm. and you're averaging uh, 45 to 55 bushels an acre for a country average, uh, they can make uh, a profit, at least cover variable costs, at $3, $3.25 wheat. Uh, do they need more, want more profit? Sure they do, but they can make a profit. They're more competitive in the market uh, than us because, and they will continue to put the inputs in that product because they can cover those variable costs. So really, it, it, it comes down to managing what we have in the ground right now and, and, and what we'll put in the ground. Uh, that's correct. Uh, luck, you know, you, you can't do anything without the weather. You can't do anything without moisture, which we're not getting a whole lot of right now. Right. But you know and I know that our crop's going to be determined in both quantity and quality in the uh, March, April, May time period. That's when to make sure you've got down the, the nutrients that it's needed, and that's when we need, it, need the timely rains and the good weather to produce that product. But the time to start thinking about that and planning for it is December, January. Right, and I think um, putting a pencil to it, it's not, uh, is it going to cost me uh, $10 an acre to uh, get it down? That's $10. I'm not making any money, so I'm losing it. If, if I can put it down for $10 an acre and I can get uh, $15 and five bushels, if I can increase by five bushel at $3 wheat, right. I'm making five bucks an acre more or losing $5 an acre less than I would have if I hadn't have made that investment. So you got to look at the margin. You got to look, you know, all the cost you've got is, is history. Right. If I put a dollar in it, am I going to get more than a dollar out of it? That's the question, and that's the way to run that pencil. Okay, thank you much, Kim. I love wheat Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Cinnery oak occurs in a pretty small part of the country. It's in western Oklahoma, uh, throughout the Texas Panhandle, and in eastern New Mexico and it's a low-growing clonal oak. So it typically stays less than waist tall, um, and it's an important wildlife plant. So there's a lot of conservation value, especially for bobwhite and wild turkey. And it produces a very large acorn, but they usually don't persist very long into the fall. Wildlife and insects consume them. And then when it leafs out later on in the spring, it has a very irregular, uh, jagged leaf margin. It's slightly glossy and dark green. And this plant is highly adapted to fire. When it's burned, it comes, uh, re-sprouts rapidly from the roots and within two or three years, the plant is back to the structure it was before the fire took place. So in addition to providing acorns for food, uh, 
A lot of birds actually eat the catkins off of these oak, and particularly they use it for cover, both for cover from predation, but also for thermal cover uh, to shield them from the midday sun. A landowner might have an interest in trying to get shinnery back on the landscape for the cover it provides and also for the food resources it provides. And so we're hoping to be able to provide some uh, best management practices to landowners in the future. But right now we really are kind of at ground zero. We really don't know how to grow it. So last year we started with collecting hundreds of acorns and we're uh, you know, experimenting with different stratifications and different um, light levels to see how we can best grow these in greenhouses to transplant them back into the sandy soils. If a landowner wants to do shinnery restoration, how can they go about that? So we're partnering with the Forest Research Station in Idabel through OSU uh, to learn about acorn germination and survival, rhizome survival, and then also about transplanting it back into these sandy soils. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. <laughs>